morning, Grace Church. I hope you're all well. Let me read from Isaiah 57, verse 15, to prepare for worship. For thus says the one who is, in, who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. So as we sing this morning, let our hearts and our minds be filled with the truth that God who created the entire universe, God who uh, in, is great in majesty and holiness, also dwells in our hearts and has given us, given us the right to, be called, to call him Father by the death of his son Jesus on the cross. So please stand with us and let's sing praises to a holy God. commands all the hosts of heaven who else could make every king bow down who else can whisper and darkness tremble only a holy God what other beauty demands such praises what other splendor outshines the sun what other majesty rules with justice only a holy God come and behold him the one Sing home. 
sing holy forever a holy God come and worship the holy God dear Heavenly Father we just thank you so much Lord for showing us each and every day your love and Father, even though you are so holy and perfect, Lord, you still love us so much. And Father, we just thank you for that. We ask that you would be with us here as we are worshiping you. We ask that this offering of praise would be just sweet to you, Lord. And we thank you for, for your love and for your kindness to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory Who have you argued with the most or fought with the longest? Chances are it was 
your brother or sister. My sister and I, when we were children, we fought a lot. Right now, we get along pretty well. We have a good relationship. But when we were children, we fought a lot. And whenever we would get in trouble, we always felt like the other one was at fault. Sibling rivalry is probably the most pervasive uh, conflict in human experience. In fact, one of the oldest feuds in the Bible is a feud between two brothers, two twin brothers, Jacob and Esau. And this prophecy, the prophecy of Obadiah, deals with God's judgment on one of those brothers and his descendants. As we open up God's Word, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask You to teach us from Your Word. Show us the truth that You would have us to learn today. Open up this uh, prophecy to us to understand it to be changed by it. We thank you, God, for the gift of your word. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. When you open the book of Obadiah, you'll see first that it has only one chapter. So chapter 1, verse 1 says the vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us rise against her for battle. The name Obadiah is a Hebrew word meaning servant of Yahweh or servant of God. It was a common name uh, in several generations and various references throughout the Old Testament. Obadiah doesn't give us any information about himself or of the time of his writing. But we can look at verses 11 through 13 and they seem to reference attacks on Jerusalem in 605, 597, and 586 B.C. It is the shortest book in the Old Testament, just 21 verses. This prophecy is directed toward Edom and serves as a prophetic, compa as a prophetic companion to Jeremiah 49, 7 through 22, and Amos chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. The people of Edom were descendants of Esau, who lived in the region southeast of the Dead Sea, within the boundary of the Jordan, within the boundary of the country of Jordan today. God's wrath against Edom is the subject of this book. And Obadiah prophesies that God will destroy Edom because of its pride and violent anger towards Israel, particularly in taking advantage of attacks against Judah, ultimately, at the end, the kingdom will be the Lord's. So why was God's wrath directed towards Edom? Let's look at some reminders of the background of Esau and the descendants of, of uh, Esau. Esau and Jacob were twin brothers born to Isaac and Rebekah, and they were grandsons of Abraham and Sarah. In Genesis chapter 25, we find that they began fighting or struggling together before they were even born. And the Lord said to Rebekah, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the older shall serve the younger. Esau was born first, and by tradition would have the birthright. Now remember, the birthright means both rights and responsibilities. In other words, the eldest would inherit a double portion of the family estate, but also have the responsibility of managing the estate and caring for all the elderly relatives and those young ones that need care within the extended family. Apparently, they rivaled each other as long uh, they rivaled each other all through childhood and into adulthood. There are signs that they played their father and mother against each other and clashed over their approval and affection. The, the family estate that they grew up in was a domestic estate, raising and shepherding herds of sheep and goats. Jacob stayed near, tending the family business, which pleased Mother Rebekah. But Esau loved to go off hunting, which favored 
father Isaac. Now, we remember one time that uh, Esau traded his birthright to his brother Jacob for a bowl of lentil stew. This shows, one, that Esau did not want the birthright and the responsibility that goes along with it. He'd rather be free to roam around. He flippantly releases the birthright to his brother. The Bible says that Esau despised, despised his birthright. And two... We also remember that Jacob was cruel and taking advantage of his brother's weaknesses. He made Esau swear that the birthright swear away his birthright before sharing him a bowl of stew. Esau cared little for the birthright. The Bible says that or he cared greatly for he he cared little for the birthright. Esau cared little for his birthright, but he cared greatly for his father's blessing. When he found that his brother had stolen, had also stolen his birthright, he was enraged and began planning to kill his brother from then on. <clears throat> so Jacob flees his brother. He flees the wrath of his brother and, and leaves his home. He leaves behind, if you think about it, this family estate that he would have had. He leaves behind his parents. He leaves behind his aging father and his mother and flees to another land to make a life for himself and find a wife and eventually have children. After a time passes, Esau pursues Jacob. When, Esau, when Jacob does return, Esau hears of his brother's return and pursues Jacob with 400 men. Now, Jacob makes a plan that seems to soften Jacob's heart for a while. God softened, Jacob, uh, softened Esau's heart. And uh, they had a, an apparent truce but yet they remain separate and become separate nations. Now, uh, as a recap here, in Genesis 27, uh, Esau had promised and planned to kill his brother. This caused Jacob to flee in fear. Jacob abandoned the rights and responsibilities of his birthright that he had stolen from his brother. Years later, in Genesis 32, he returns and... From fear of his brother, he divides his family and has part of his estate, his, his sheep and goats and, and family, travel ahead of him. Maybe this will appease the angry Esau. Then in fear, he divides yet again and sends another portion of his estate in front of him, hoping to appease Esau. This is where we see Jacob spend the night and famously wrestle with God is because of his fear of facing his brother Jacob is what caused that. Now, God softens the heart of Esau temporarily and he doesn't kill him when they meet, but they continue to remain separate and they go their separate ways and apparently they never met again after this. Now let's look at a second phase in the relationship between Jacob and Esau. After many years pass, Esau's descendants are named the Edomites. They become the Edomites. And Jacob's descendants, Jacob was renamed Israel. His descendants uh, through, uh, the, 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 uh, through the sons of Jacob uh, are, they travel to Egypt and they're enslaved in Egypt for many years. And when, they, uh, when God sets them free as they follow Moses back to the promised land, we have another episode in the relationship between Esau and Jacob. Number, and this is found in Numbers chapter 20. Moses was leading the people of Israel and through the desert, through uh, 
suffering thirst and hunger, that God had provided manna and water for them, and now they were having an opportunity to travel now finally into their promised land. And they came to the land of the Edomites. And Moses is faced with an issue of the descendants of Jacob, the descendants of Jacob now facing the descendants of Esau. So he sent messengers to Kadesh, the king of Edom. This is Numbers chapter 20, verse 14. Thus says your brother Israel, You know all the hardships that we have met, how our fathers went down to Egypt, and we lived in Egypt a long time. And the Egyptians dealt harshly with us and our fathers. And when we cried to the Lord, and He heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. And here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your territory. Please let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or vineyard or drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we have passed through your territory. Verse 18. But Edom said to him, You shall not pass through, lest I come out with a sword against you. And the people of Israel said to him, We will go up by the highway, and if we drink any of your water and my livestock, then and, and my and if we drink your water and my livestock, and then I will pay for it. Let me pass only through on foot, nothing more. But he said, You shall not pass through. And Edom came out against them with a large army and a strong force. <clears throat> this reference to the king's highway was a well-traveled route that passed through the land of the Edomites. Many people continued to pass through the land here. Yet Edom refused to give them any passage or any care whatever. No water, no food, not even passage along the highway for his close relative, the Israelites. Strangers, yes, they passed through, but his brother, no. When pressed, Edom backed up his refusal with a show of violent force. Now we move into the third phase of this rivalry between Jacob and his brother Esau and the Edomites. Phase three is the Babylonians attack on Judah and Edom stands by, refuse to help and, aid, and instead aid their enemies and they scavenge what remains. We can find hints of this if we look in uh, the text of Obadiah, Obadiah itself in verse 11 through 14. Let me read. Verse 11 through 14 of Obadiah. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother and the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. Do not enter into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Do not stand at the crossroads and cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. Now the land that Edom occupied to the southwest of the Dead Sea was high and rocky and arid. It could have offered defense against an attack on Judah. It could have cut off access to the, south, uh, the southeast border of, the, of Israel. They could have helped defend Judah against the Babylonians, but they stood back and let them suffer. In fact, they rejoiced over their suffering. Verse 13 says that Edom looted the wealth of Judah, meaning they plundered what remained. And many Edomites had moved in during this time and occupied the vacated homes 
in the land of Judah. Verse 14 tells us that Edom actually stood at the crossroads and cut down Israelites seeking refuge or escape. Rather than cut off the Edomite, or cut off the Babylonians, they cut off the Israelites that were seeking refuge and gave them no refuge. Now, here we've saw three phases in the life of the conflict between Judah and Esau. And what began as a conflict between brothers escalated into an angry, uh, an angry threat of murder. And that hatred was carried on to their descendants after them. So much so that the Edomites refused to even offer, trans, even offer passage to their brothers as they came, uh, uh, came from, uh, from, from uh, Egypt as slaves. And now it carries on into generations later uh, when God was uh, allowing punishment on Judah as the Babylonians came in, Edom participated and let it happen. So now let's take a look at the rest of the, the middle of the book of Obadiah where we go to what the actual sins that God spells out and the reasons for His uh, condemnation and judgment on Edom. What does God say they were? Well, the way I read it, there's actually five. <laughs> One we find stated right here very clearly, but the other four we go over to the book previous in Amos and borrow from that to find the other four. Let's look first at the, at the first one, pride, in Obadiah chapter 1, verse 3. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, Who will bring me down to the ground? Pride. The Edomite land was cliffs, rock mountains, and high plateaus. It was hard to sneak attack on them. They felt a sense of security in their location. And this led to pride of the heart. In our world, we tend to overlook the sin of pride. Other sins get more attention because they're more offensive, more offensive to us, perhaps murder, theft, adultery. But there are other reasons we tend to overlook pride. It's easy to ignore our own pride. It's hidden right here. It's easy to hide our pride. And it's so close to the heart and to the sin of idolatry. Pride's first casualty is our heart when we shut out God and then our eyes and our ears when we shut out others and then we no longer notice or care who we hurt. God hates pride. Proverbs chapter 8 verse 13 says, The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance, and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate, says the Lord. Pride is also very destructive. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a, before a fall. Many who come to the very bottom of the barrel, <laughs> whether it be in addiction or in suffering harmful behaviors, will test, they will testify that the last thing that kept them from repenting was pride. Pride. Pride is ultimately a rejection of God. Pride says, I don't need God, or I can live without God. James 4, 6 says, but He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, referring to the Old Testament, God opposes the proud, but gives, gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So even here we see, and I ask you, uh, Grace Church, in our own lives, if you see the sin of pride 
in your heart. Most of the time, it'll be others who see it first in your behaviors or in your actions. So I say if you're going to recognize the sin of pride, first you pray and you ask God to reveal pride in your heart. Second, you keep your eyes and ears open to listen to those who God's put in your life. What do they have to say? Do they point out areas of pride in your own heart? If so, don't reject that. Listen. Open your heart and listen. And third, ask. Ask those closest to you and those loved ones. Are there areas, ask them, are there areas of pride in my life that you see that I don't? Things that I need to be aware of? And if you have uh, loved ones who are believers, your wife, your children, your uh, family, your brothers and sisters in Christ, they'll be honest with you and they'll help you to see the things that you can't see. So that was the first sin uh, that God spells out for, for Edom, pride. Now, let's look at those other four. If you could turn to Amos chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. Amos chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. And I'm going to read these quickly with, and make some comments. Amos chapter 1, verse 11 through 12. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because he pursued his brother with the sword. That's number one. Number two, and cast off all pity. Number, th number three, and his anger tore perpetually. And number four, and he kept his wrath forever. So I will send a fire upon Teman, and it shall devour the strongholds of Bozrah. Now, Teman and Bozrah were two regions in Edom that really represent north and south or east and west or the full scope of the nation of Edom. Of Edom. They were also uh, places, but this, this was really a condemnation of the entire nation of Edom, not just these cities or these regions. So we see those four uh, sins that God lay, lays out. Let's take the first one. Because he per pursued his brother with the, with the sword. I can summarize this as violence or the threat of violence. Obadiah 1.10 says, Because of the violence done to your brothers, Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. Now, the Edomites might say, Esau never killed his brother Jacob. Or the Edomites may say, We never actually did harm to our brothers. We just refused to let them have passage in our land. But let me tell you, there was a threat of violence. And the threat of violence had a great effect on, Jake, on Jacob's descendants, or Jacob and his descendants. Esau had promised to kill his brother, which caused Jacob to flee in fear. Jacob had abandoned the rights and responsibilities of his birthright, and his family was affected from then on. And we see later that it caused the division that ultimately led to the separation of the two brothers into two separate nations. This for the threat of violence from his brother. Next, we see the sin of the, that he cast off all pity. He cast off all pity. In other words, a lack of care. A lack of care. Edom showed a lack of care for the needs of his brother. So, Grace Church, when we show a lack of care, or when Edom showed a lack of care to Jacob and his descendants, God says they, they were just like those that actually performed evil acts upon them. They were just like the Babylonians. And so today, God's saying to us, if we show a lack of care or pity to those among us or those that we, we have the, uh, the opportunity to, to help or to do something about, if we show lack of care, then the guilt of carelessness is, it lumps, on, lumps onto us 
the evil acts that we see others do. Edom refused to allow Moses and his descendants uh, of Jacob to pass through uh, their land. And this is an act of, act of uh, a sin against them. Third and fourth, we see that his anger tore perpetually and he kept his wrath forever. I, you can restate those as continual anger and unforgiveness. So this is important. Grace Church, to look at continual anger. Anger is an emotion. And emotions are things that God gives us. Sometimes God gives us anger uh, for important reasons. Anger to see when something is wrong and right and do the and change it and do the right thing. Anger can make us aware of things uh, to protect ourselves or others. Uh, anger is an emotion that God gives us for, for a purpose. But when we harbor that anger, when we hang on to that anger, when we do not use the anger for what God meant to show, to show wrong that needs to make right, when we instead harbor that anger and focus that anger against our brother and harbor a grudge that turns into a pledge of violence, in this, like in this case, or when it turns into uh, systematic changes of behavior towards our brothers, our sisters, then this is sin. And God wouldn't stand for it. God said it's because of these sins that calamity would fall and judgment would fall on Edom. Continual anger leads to continual unforgiveness. And even, I'm reminding us that even Jesus taught us when we prayed that as we forgive others, so God forgives us. Now, uh, he's saying in that, that as you've been forgiven for your multitude of as I've been forgiven for my multitude of sins, so I need to be able to forgive others and not hold, hold things against them, hold their sins against me. So, these are the sins uh, that God identifies in Edom and why He's passing judgment on them. Let's look now to verse 4 through 9 of Obadiah, and we see a review of the complete destruction on the nation of Edom. Let me read uh, these verses, verse 4 through, uh, through 9. Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Remember the lofty position of the Edomites? If thieves came to you, if plunderers came by night, how you have been destroyed? Would they not steal only enough for themselves? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? How Esau has been pillaged and his treasures sought. Verse 5 and 6 is God speaking directly and urgently to the people of Edom. This harm that's come to you, this destruction that's come to you, if in your pride you think that this was just coincidence, that this was just you blame your enemies, that this just happened because thieves or robbers came along, not so. They would have left something behind. They would only take what they could carry or they would only take what they wanted and left the rest. But when Edom was plundered, and when Edom was destroyed, when these curses came down and this judgment came on Edom, it was entire destruction. Entire destruction. God's reminding them that the calamity that came was judgment from God. Judgment from God for these sins. Now, verse 7. All your allies have driven you to your border, those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. You have no understanding. He's saying they didn't even know what was happening to them and didn't recognize that this was the judgment of the Lord. Verse 8, Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau, and your mighty men shall be, shall be dismayed? O Teman, 
though, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. Now, the wording of these words that I've read here uh, leads to some speculation as to the timing of the fulfillment of this prophecy. One way you could read this makes it appear that all of this is, had already happened during the time of the Babylonians. Some say maybe it happened later on. And there's some that maybe say that, uh, well, they, they look at the fact that it, today the Edomites are not in that place. That place is now empty and uh, uh, empty of the Edomites. They're no longer there. And so this prophecy is completely fulfilled. Some would look at it and say, no, God saved a remnant of Edomites somewhere nearby or somewhere else for a yet as yet future final destruction that will fully uh, fulfill all of these prophecies. As they're read, that's the, that's some, some believe that. Either way, this passage shows that the destruction of Edom is God's wrath and God's wrath coming to fruition. And listen, Grace Church, this is the wrath that we would all suffer, that all would suffer without the mercy and grace of salvation. <laughs> this wrath. So, it's easy for us to sit here as I began, I talked about my sister and I when we used to fight. And when our parents would come in and stop the fight, the first thing we would do is beg for mom and dad to see our side and get the other one in trouble. Or my sister would want to see her side and get me in trouble. We wanted God, the wrath of our parents to come down on our other sibling. <laughs> and I'm sure the Israelites would, after having suffered a lot of punishment, would read this and take solace and say, well, thank the Lord that at least the Edomites now will be punished too since they stood by and didn't help. But listen, look at verse 15. And I believe this verse 15 may be the key to this whole prophecy. Verse 15 says, For the day of the Lord is near upon all nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. Once again, For the day of the Lord is near upon all nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. And your deeds shall return on your own head. When I read through this, and I would say that when we read through this today and see this lengthy description of terrible judgment suffered by Edom. Friends, we should see that this is the judgment that all sin will come to. That all sin will come to. And realize how desperately and how truly we need the grace and mercy of our Savior Jesus Christ who came and lived among us a sinless life. A sinless life that His death on the cross would take our place and pay the price and penalty for our sin. That we could t trade <laughs> our sin for His righteousness, that covered in the righteousness of Christ, we can enjoy the salvation of the Lord and be held safe and redeemed from this punishment that would face us. And, you know, some may be here today, some may have listened to this, and maybe you've heard that before. But today, God is speaking to your heart in a way that you haven't heard before. That uh, you, you realize that in your own heart, 
that you have held pride in your heart that keeps you from turning and accepting the salvation that Jesus has to offer. And I would say that that is worth, that your pride is worth very little. <laughs> it's not needed. It can be discarded. God is asking you now to repent and come to Him and ask Him humbly to forgive your sins. You can tell Him that you know that what you've done is wrong and that you need His salvation. And the Lord will come to you and take your sins and forgive them and bring you home to Him. Let's look here at the last verse of this, of this passage that tells us what, uh, what the end and what the, the message of God is for the end of this prophecy. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. This is talking about a day when Judah will be restored, Mount Zion will be restored, and God will rule uh, not, not any, any particular one, not any particular one of us, not someone who in his human abilities deserves to be the ruler, but God and God alone. The kingdom shall be the Lord's. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your coming kingdom. We thank you for your righteous Son who died for us, who died to pay the price for our sins and died to redeem us and rose again on our behalf, O oh God. We thank you for this prophecy, this short book that teaches us to understand the sins that bring God's wrath, the sins that bring punishment. And Lord, help us to look at those and identify how you will redeem us from those sins and how you show that when our brother is hungry, by the power of God, we should feed our brother. And when our brother is thirsty, by the power of God, we should give him drink. And by the power of God, we should not hold anger, continual anger over our brother or unforgiveness. But Lord, let us take the redemption that you give to let a light shine on your holy mountain that the kingdom will be the Lord's. And it's in the name of your holy and righteous Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Just put
Psalm 103, verses 11 through 13. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our, tra our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Amen. God bless you, Grace Church. We love you. We'll see you soon. And... Happy Father's Day.